Well, good afternoon, everyone. So since Fred gave you a test, I'll give you a test. Um, how many of you had heard about MOOCs before you walked in to the room today? He's right. You, can't, you really can't see. How many of you have taken a MOOC? OK. So we have something to talk about. Um, that was a great introduction. Uh, thanks, thanks, Lynn, and, and thanks for the, the invitation, Kelly, and, and, and everyone um, for being here today. So I want to talk about higher education. And, and it's, it's a big topic. And I want to kind of bring it down to something that I think is, um, is actionable for this group. And, and kind of plays into what's turned out to be a global conversation about what universities are and what their role is uh, in the economy, what their role in society is. And I, I just I have, to, I have to tell you that, that, that I've been spending a lot of time in the last couple years talking to groups like this, and, and they are groups from around the world. The, 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 the conversations that we're going to have today are conversations that are being held a hundred times in the U.S., a thousand times um, around, around the world. And no matter where you go, everyone is worried about the status of their own university. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little, um, uh, a little tough love talking about American universities and, 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 and Georgia universities. Uh, but understand that if you go to Europe, if you go to Asia, if you go to, go to Africa, everyone is looking at American universities and saying, that's the gold standard. That's what we want to be. You know, the, the Times of London publishes an annual ranking of world universities, mainly research universities. But they, but they rank um, maybe 1,000 universities around the world. And, and in the top 100, it's called the THE, one, 100. Sixty percent of those universities are American universities. So what do we have to worry about? We have 60 percent of the top 100 universities in the, in the world. The catch is that those 100 universities enroll one half of one percent of all college students in the world. The 60 universities in the THE 100 enroll, generously speaking, 8% of American college students. So what about the other 90% who aren't going to Georgia Tech or Stanford or UGA or Duke? What happens to them? And that's, that's when the discussion gets difficult. That's when the discussion gets, um, uh, gets pretty, pretty interesting. Just by way of, of, of leading into this discussion, I wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago uh, that, that tried to explain um, to, um, not to other professors, because we talk about this among ourselves all the time, but, but tried to, to explain to the general public how it is that the current system of higher education in the United States got to the state that it's, um, that it's in. The title of the book was Abelard. To, to, to Apple. Apple is referring to Apple Computer, um, uh, and Apple Computer was one of the first to launch a big online marketplace of courses called iTunes U. Uh, Abelard is probably a name that not many of you know. Um, Abelard uh, was arguably the first university professor, uh, an 11th century French monk uh, who, who was kind of an, an iconoclastic guy, managed to draw people from around Europe to hear his lectures on, on philosophy. He was a really successful kind of teacher, and, and, and he's recognized today as one of the founders of, of, of Western approaches to higher education. The interesting thing about Peter Abelard is that, that he didn't need a university to do this. So this was before the University of Paris. This was f before the University of Bologna. It was just one charismatic professor who didn't mind tweaking the nose of the church authorities, who was a compelling speaker and could draw people in to hear his discussions. And so the story I was telling in Abelard to Apple was what happened 
in the thousand years from Peter Abelard to the appearance of iTunes, iTunes U. What has happened to higher education? And now I'm working on another book um, because everyone sort of understands how we got to this point and, and they want to know what's next. So the book I'm writing now, uh, I'm calling an atlas. And it's not an atlas in the sense of driving maps. It's an atlas in the sense of being a collection of road maps. What is happening in higher education? What's going to happen? What's inevitable for colleges and, and universities? So I want to spend the little time I have this afternoon talking about that and leave, leave ample time for, um, for questions. So let's take a place like Georgia Tech. Uh, Georgia Tech has on campus about 20,000 20, students. If you count generously, we have an alumni base of another 120,000 living alumni, so 140,000 people that we touch in some way or another. This past October 1st, Georgia Tech's enrollment in massive open online courses past the 500,000 student mark. That's five times the number of people that we reach compared to what the bricks and mortar institution reach. Now, and we're gonna come back to this point, you have to ask yourself, so what, what does that mean? Those aren't all students, those are people that have just managed to enroll uh, in a website. But the fact of the matter is that among those 500,000 students are literally hundreds of thousands of people that knew nothing about Georgia Tech before they enrolled in the massive open online, online courses. And then you heard about the massive open online course approach to a low cost master's program where we promised not only a $7,000 master's degree, we promised the same quality as a bricks and mortar master's degree at a place like, like Georgia Tech. This little story that I'm telling is going on a hundred times around the country. There's change taking place in higher education at a rate that is really unimaginable. I, I, I've been through technology changes in my, in my career. And the rate of change, the pace of change in higher education is absolutely terrifying. I thought when we rolled out the first e-commerce servers in the mid 90s, that things were moving very quickly. The innovation cycle in higher education can be measured in weeks. In the last 18 months, a billion dollars in risk capital has poured into educational technology in Silicon Valley alone. That's the biggest increase in a new business area ever. Every week there's a new company popping up. New students being, being reached. So what's driving this? What's, what's driving this, this accelerated pace of, of, of change? There's a few things, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back and, and talk about some of these in a little more, um, little more detail. Some of them I think you know, some of them you probably don't know. Um, so cost and performance, I think is one that when we open up the paper, we're used to seeing tuitions going up, completion rates going down, what's with that? Um, that has driven a whole conversation about why are tuition costs going up the way that they are? Why is it that universities and colleges, particularly public universities and colleges, can't seem to graduate students in four, five, six years? International competition is, is a big piece um, of, of this. As I said, we're a big target for, for Asia. We're a big target for, um, for places in the world that really want to emulate the success of American universities. And then I hate to say it, there's been a lot loss of, of public confidence in colleges and universities. Pew Research does an annual poll, kind of a, a pulse beat of, of 
how do people feel about colleges and universities? How do insiders feel? How do outsiders feel? And for the first time last year, the majority of the people surveyed by Pew didn't feel that a college degree was worth the price of tuition. 55%. And then you hear stories about Peter Thiel and, and, and Silicon Valley companies saying, forget about the degree, come and work for us. We want your innovative talent. We don't care much about the, the credential. And working for an institution that is all about credentials, that kind of creates a problem. Increased demand for graduates. Believe it or not, we are still on an increased demand curve for college graduates. Now, it matters what you study. It matters how well you do when you study. It matters where you go to school. But for the vast bulk of college students who graduate with skills-oriented degrees, these would be in the professions, would be in business, would be in engineering, that demand is growing at a sustained rate. And we can't meet it. And then finally, finally, there are new discoveries. And, and that's what I want to spend a little time um, talking about. This has been not only a business-driven innovation cycle. This is a discovery-driven innovation cycle. What's happening in higher education, the reason that everyone is talking about MOOCs, the reason that no matter what national newspaper you open, there's going to be a front page story about someone developing a new kind of technology, is that technology. There's no one that I know of who looks at higher education in this country that thinks that it's on a sustainable path. And let's just get real basic about this. Most universities, public, private, discount their prices so far below cost that they'll never make it up. And you can't sustain yourself very long. Now, granted, there are islands of excellence. You know, in, in the, the, the sea of 4,000 colleges and universities in the US, there's, there's a few, relatively few, maybe 200, that manage year after year to be financially sustainable, sustainable from a performance um, standpoint. But the vast bulk don't. And so the question is, how do you take these islands of excellence in this sea of problems and turn it into a system that performs well? You have to have a game changer. You have to do something, do something differently. And of course, there are many ideas about how to do that. Let me just mention the one that, that everyone who looks at this problem comes back to um, and, and, um, and comes to the same, the same conclusion. Uh, higher education is, is a high-end service industry. And like every high-end service industry, it either benefits from productivity increases or not. Like symphony orchestras, like dentists, higher education has not benefited from productivity increases. And high-end service industries that don't benefit from productivity increases are subject to what's called a cost disease, which means that even though prices for the kinds of people you employ in the general population go up because of productivity increases, you can't benefit from that. So your prices go up, go up disproportionately more than the, than the inflation rate. It's called the cost disease. And, and as far back as people have looked at higher education, higher education has been subject to the cost disease. Prices in higher education have gone up twice the rate of inflation for about 100 years. Why has it become noticeable all of a sudden? 
well, a few things. One, one is we had, we had um, a recession, uh, and one of the results of the recession was that subsidies that used to exist to balance the cost increases have disappeared. Another reason is that universities were reluctant to stop doing things that they could no longer afford to do. And, not surprisingly, the ability of people to pay those increased prices was slipping. So you put all that together, and, and, and one of the things that, that you would hope is that there would be some productivity increases that would hit higher education and help out. But what, what might that be? I mean, people have been talking about computerized instruction for a long time, distance learning, uh, putting more or less people in classrooms, using, using lower, skilled, um, lower skilled labor, part-time teachers. Uh, in the, none of that has seemed to, seemed to help very much. And the reason is, the reason is that none of those approaches ever got to the heart of the problem in higher education, which is learning. So I'm drilling down to where the idea of MOOCs came from and what they're used for. None of this matters. None of what I'm saying matters if people walk into a classroom and they don't learn anything. They can graduate and not find jobs. They can enroll in college and not, and not graduate. They can find themselves in positions that, that the degree would say that they're not, that they're not, not suited for. Well, so th this has been a problem for a long time. How do, you, how, do you, how do you address the increased cost of education, lower performance in the classroom without automation? You have to be able to automate somehow. There's some science behind this. So if I can just take a 15-second digression into the science of, of this, I think it'll help set the context for what I'm going to say next. In the early 1980s, an educational psychologist named Benjamin Bloom, educational psychologist at the University of Chicago, did a study. And Bloom and his students looked at what everyone had said mattered in the classroom. And they classified the way classrooms were run. They, they said, well, there's a normal classroom. It's the one that you and I recognize. You walk into class, some guy like me stands in front, goes like this for 45 minutes, and you go away, and every six weeks someone gives you a test. At the end of the semester, you pass or fail. Let's call that the normal classroom. It's the one we all understand. There's also something called a mastery classroom. And Bloom identified the mastery classroom as one in which you don't permit a student to go on to the next concept until they've mastered the previous concept. Ideally, these are concepts that are kind of 15-minute bite-sized intervals of, of content that you can test on. Lo and behold, lo and behold, students that had been through mastery classrooms performed across the board independent of geography, independent of age, independent of subject matter, independent of innate skills of the students, one standard deviation better on national exams. That means that you've moved the average, for those of you who, like me, have a hard time with statistics, you've moved the average from 50% to 70%. And furthermore, furthermore, if you give each of those students a personal tutor, what do you think happens? You move everyone another standard deviation. You move that 50% average to the 98th percentile. It's a remarkable paper. And it plays out over and over and over again. And people understand the science behind it. People understand the neurology behind it. People, uh, the, the neuroscience behind it. People understand the cognitive science behind it. But there's this paragraph at the end of the Benjamin Bloom paper. 
which says this would be a terrific way for a society to teach its students, except for one thing. What is that one thing? You can't afford it. He says at the end of his paper, no society can afford to do this. How are you going to give personal tutor to every student? How are you going to let every student go at his or her own, own pace? Well, it turns out that this is exactly what the technology behind MOOCs buys you. It gives every student the chance to be self-paced through a course. And for a well-defined course, it means that those students are going to perform better than students who have been sitting in bricks and mortar classrooms. And as the technology improves, you allow increased personalization. So to the student, it appears as if they're getting more personal attention than they were getting in the 300-person darkened lecture hall, which means that they're approaching the Benjamin Bloom ideal of having a personal, a personal tutor. So those students all move up on standardized, standardized tests. What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that these innovations that you're seeing in the online master's degree at Georgia Tech and in MOOCs in general have a serious purpose. And the serious purpose is to increase the productivity, not of individual teachers, but of the educational enterprise in general. They take away the you can'ts. The thing that stopped American higher education, higher education around the world, from turning islands of excellence into a system of excellence is the you can'ts. You can't offer personalized instruction because you can't afford it. You can't offer personalized testing because you can't afford it. You can't provide federal support for students that need federal aid that is guaranteed to improve their educational experience because you can't afford it. The technology removes the you can'ts. And that's turned out to be a very, very big deal. And in the larger context of things, in, in, in the larger context of, of, of um, those of you who have to set policy, this is the number one thing you should be thinking about. Again, people have looked across many studies. These things called meta-studies are when scientists look across other people's studies and try to draw conclusions on a large, um, on a large scale. What influences learning? There's a bunch of things that might influence learning. There's, there's a bunch of things you can't control. So smarter students are going to learn better than students that aren't as, aren't, aren't as smart. So let's kind of bunch those things together. Cognitive skills, metacognitive skills, academic knowledge. That's a bunch of things you can't control. You have to teach the students that, that come to you. And then there's a bunch of things that we think that we know something about. Policy. For example, socioeconomic status, um, um, curriculum revision, um, state, local, federal policies in, in education. We can do something about that. Or we can do what Bloom says to do in the classroom. Improve the classroom, improve learning in the classroom. The number one thing that influences learning is improving learning in the classroom. Policy reform is not even a distant third. Of the 60 parameters that affect how people learn, policy is down 40, 50, 60. The number one things are the things that you can't control, cognitive abilities of students, and the things that you can control, what happens in the classroom. So that's something that we should concentrate on. We should concentrate on, on learning. And, and there's, there's, there's a, a big picture reason for doing this. The big picture reason is that since the Truman administration, it's been the policy in the United States to improve access to higher education for US citizens and improve quality. And I have good news and bad news for you. We've done a really good job at improving access. College is available to anyone. 
at reasonable cost, even with the improved, the, the, the increased tuition prices. The bad news is that our completion rates are among the lowest in the developed world. Our completion rates are under 30 percent, which puts us more or less on a par with Italy in terms of completion rates, whereas Scandinavian countries, 90 percent of the college students complete, complete college. So what should we do? Where should we look, where should we look for, for, for help here? I, I think part of the answer should be obvious from where we've, where we've gone in this talk so far. You look to places like Silicon Valley because that's where innovation is taking place. You look at places like Georgia Tech because that's where innovation um, is taking place. Then there are some unobvious things. So among the unobvious things are ignoring the U.S. News and World Report rankings, which we drive our institutions to like we're driving a bus. We say we're not, but we're encouraging what I call institutional envy. We're encouraging institutions that don't have an idea of who they are, of what their mission is, to emulate someone above them. So we encourage private universities to emulate Ivy League universities. We encourage public universities to emulate Georgia Tech or the University of Michigan. Instead of finding out what they're good at and offering that to as many students as they can at the lowest possible, at the lowest possible price. The second thing that we should do is to take a deep breath and, and understand that this technology is going to commoditize content. Let me say that again. All of the Psych 101 and English Composition courses that you took as freshmen and sophomores can be done better using this technology. And it's going to get better and better and better all the time. And yet, there's an enormous amount of money that's spent in this country recreating mediocre content. 80% of the courses taken by 80% of the students in the first two years of college are in 18 courses. Psych 101, Composition 101, Introduction to Physical, physical Science. And most of those courses are not taught well. Even the ones that are taught well are taught inefficiently and expensively. I can think of very little reason why a middle tier institution in the Midwest would spend a penny more on a gen ed course, first two years of college, gen ed course, when you can go out to a company like Coursera or Udacity or edX and find exactly the material that would be taught in the classroom, but taught using the Bloom Mastery classroom technique by a master who knows what he or she is doing. What do you do with your professors? Well, your professors add value now by becoming mentors, by becoming, becoming advisors to their, to their students. We should be thinking seriously about alternatives to degrees. We hang on to college diplomas as if they were handed down from heaven. When in fact, in fact, what matters is what you study, how well you study it, where you study it. An associate's degree is worth less in the marketplace than a high school diploma, almost no matter where you study it. So shouldn't we be investing on what st skills students are going to need in the marketplace? We have to figure out how to break the stranglehold of accreditors on our institutions. The accrediting system in this country was invented by the same people who built steel mills and auto factories, and they looked at college as a factory. So accrediting looks nothing less than like the quality control department in a factory. 
Raw material comes in, we kick some of it out. Those are people that get Fs. We, we kind of have a test at the end. And that's how we decide what's good and what's, and what's bad. It's enormously expensive. Stanford University. Stanford University is ranked number one or two in every international ranking of universities that I know of. Stanford University spends eight cents of every tuition dollar on accreditation. Twenty million dollars a year at Stanford is spent on accreditation. None of that shows up in a Stanford degree. And the story only gets worse as you go down from, from Stanford. So we have to think of, of a way around accreditation. And people are thinking about it. People are thinking about, about accrediting not institutions but students. They're thinking about tracking students' progress through institutions. They're thinking about giving credit for what you know and what you've done, not how selective the institution is or how many feet of laboratory space they've allocated per, per student. So let me, let me leave you with um, the five questions that, that I think you should be thinking about as you think about institutions broadly around the country, institutions within the state of, 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 of Georgia. Because it, to my way of thinking, these, these are, the, these are the, the life or death questions for universities over the next 20 years. I guess the primary one is, is and, and living in a public university system, it, it's the one that you think about every day. Are, are, you, are you serving the people that you're intended to serve? It's not always an easy answer. If you have a very good teacher's college in the middle of Texas that all of a sudden has decided it wants to be the next great research university, I can guarantee you that they're not going to be serving the people that they're supposed to be serving. They're going to be building laboratories and hiring research professors that are chasing a completely different, different goal. Who are your successes? I think in order to be taken seriously as an institution of higher education, you should be able to point to a significant number of your graduates that are successful or influential people. Do you have successes? An amazing number of institutions don't. And even when you have successes, my third rule is what happens to most of your students? Do they get degrees? Do they earn over their lifetime at a way that at least allows them to recover the cost of, of tuition? So do you have peaks? Is the average going up? What do you learn? It's not always clear. You can't look at a college catalog and tell what students learn in the, in the classroom. 80 percent, 80 percent of the institutions in this country that charge $40,000 or more tuition a year don't teach what's in their catalog. If you gave them a test, if you graded institutions, as has been done by the Association of College Trustees uh, and Alumni, if you, if you graded institutions, A, B, C, D, F, the expensive institutions in the United States would get overwhelmingly D's and F's. Ivy League institutions average D. The institutions in this state average B+. Plus. It's one of the reasons that you're seeing the state of Georgia moving to the forefront of leaders in higher education. And then finally, how important are you? How important are you to your city, to your state, to your, to your, would anyone notice if you actually disappeared? It's not an easy question to ask. It's an even harder question to, to answer. But I think those five questions kind of encapsulate what is going to be happening in higher education over the next generation. And, and I'm always much too conservative about, about the, the pace of, pace of, of change. I, when, when, I, when I wrote Abelard to Apple, I thought I was writing about a generational change. And in fact, this revolution has happened in the last four years. So we're seeing change happening at an unprecedented scale. So these questions are going to be asked every month 
every legislative cycle, every time that there's a hard financial decision that a board of trustees has to make about whether an institution contracts or disappears, disappears completely. So it's all about value. It's a controversial thing in higher education to say that, that, that higher education is about value because people equate that to dollar value and then you get into long, never-ending discussions about you know, what's the value of knowing Chaucer versus what's the value of knowing how to be a really good computer programmer. Um, but it is about value, and it becomes more about value the more you ask of people intuition. Um, what do you want to do? It's a good question to ask an institution. It's a good inst question to ask a college president. What is it that you, that you want to do? Where do you want to take your institution? You better have a good answer for that. And then, and then the question that started all of this is what are the you can'ts? What's stopping you from, from doing that? And, and I think increasingly the you can'ts are being erased by technology. The really great thing about what's happened in in University System of Georgia, what's happening at Georgia Tech, what's happening in the partner institutions that we talk to around the country, is that the institutions that have the most to lose are the ones who've taken the bull by the horn here and said, we want to improve teaching, we want to improve pedagogy. Stanford University has gone on a hiring campaign for educational specialists. Why? Because they think that education can be improved not only for Stanford, but for the country as a whole. Georgia Tech has created my organization, the Center for 21st Century Universities, to be able to experiment with higher education, to be able to make mistakes, to be able to find out what's going to work in the future, and then translate that into practice, practice very quickly. So it's a big topic. Uh, I, 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 think, I think there are a lot of reasons for being optimistic. It's certainly a point in my career where I thought I'd be playing golf by now, and, and I, I find myself uh, on, on airplanes uh, talking to, uh, to trustees, presidents, um, groups like this that have a vital interest in higher education. And I hope you'll be with us, and I hope to hear some good questions about where things are going. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, just a reminder, we do have microphones in the room, so if you'll raise your hand, we'll make sure a microphone gets to your position. Thank you. My name is uh, Drew Evangelista. I head up educational mobile learning platforms for AT&T, so K-12 and higher ed. So very excited about where a things are headed. AT&T is the partner for the master's. Yeah, so master's a, a, a big partner there. Um, hybrid and online courses are becoming more common, more popular, a, a common part of, of higher ed now. But to take that next step, to go ahead and move towards the degree program, I think it takes a, a lot of vision and courage. So congr congratulations on that, taking that actual step. But when it comes to, you mentioned, you know, skills-based degrees, which is what I think one of the biggest problems are, is that people don't do that. And people, a lot of the, you talked about the rankings. One thing Georgia Tech's been hit on a lot of times is not having people graduate in four years. Whereas I commonly say to people, if you're graduating in four years, you're kind of not getting the point. You're not necessarily ready. So five and six years is very common at times. Right, right. Um, what do you think are other types of programs that really were geared towards a MOOC that can go beyond computer science. What other skills-oriented degrees you think are logical and are the next step beyond computer well, it's, science? Well, it's, it's, it's a great question. It, it's hard to imagine um, something that you learn as an undergraduate that doesn't have a skills-based component to it. The, the fact is we don't test for that. We don't, we don't try to figure out what it is that people, um, it is that, that, that people know. I think the biggest hurdle that we have right now is the one I mentioned in passing, accreditation, um, which, is, which is a very input-oriented regulatory mindset. You know, we're going we're gonna to measure this stuff coming in, and, and therefore we know something about the quality of the product um, coming, coming out. And study after study has shown that that's just not, just not true. Um, so you're going to see, I, I think, a variety of programs roll out. Who's heard of General Assembly? General Assembly, it's a .ly on the, on, on, on the end. So this is, this is one of the latest things in, in online education. So gen, General Assembly is, is, is a collection of people that are highly skilled at teaching skills. Operates independently of a university. 
So if you want to know what it's like to build a lean startup business plan, there's a track in General Assembly that teaches you how to do that and connects you with people who are, who are, are, are doing it. Um, if you want to know how to write this kind, of, this kind of program, there's a track in General Assembly that allows you to do that. If you want to be an expert in 3D printing, there's a track in General Assembly that, that tells, you how to, tells you how to do that. So, so as, of, as these not quite courses, not quite colleges come online, the smart universities are going to be the ones that embrace them. So they're going to be the ones that say, that's a skill that we want our students to have. We're going to figure out a way of giving you credit for that, regardless of whether or not the feds give you credit for it. We're going to give you credit for it, and we're going to build it into your, into your curriculum. Now, I mean, that, that requires universities to kind of open things up and, 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 and become, um, uh, you know, become collaborative in a way that, that a lot of places are uncomfortable doing. But, but it seems like every six months, there's a new wave of innovation like that that's going to come up. Uh, University of Southern New Hampshire, it's not a university that I would bet many people in the room were familiar with, um, uh, has petitioned the Department of Education to offer Title IV funding for competency-based credits. That is, if you can prove that you know material, you can apply Pell Grant funding, you can apply uh, uh, federally guaranteed loans to that, to that skill set. Um, that ability was always there. The Department of Education has, has had this uh, in, its, in its rules for a long time. There's never been a university that stepped up and said, we, we want to give that a try. So those are experiments. Some will succeed, some will, some will fail. Um, you know, it's, a way of, it's a way of finding out what, what works. Um, the last thing is, is this idea that we can test our way out of, um, uh, out of actually teaching, teaching people. Um, you know, a friend of mine, um, former, former educational psychologist at Yale University named Roger Shank, uh, has, has a firm belief that, that if you test at the end of a course, it tells you nothing. If you wait a year and test on that same material, you actually find out what people, what people learn. Now, we don't know how to do that. Again, it's a you can't that's built into the system, but technology will surely help with that. We have time for two more questions, folks. Yes. Um, Two-part question, so answer whichever one if there's only two left. One is around, uh, if, do you see 10, 20 years down the road with the commoditization of those core early classes and with more digital learning that, and with a Georgia Tech uh, online degree being um, lower cost, that the mid and smaller tier universities could be basically priced out of the market, whereas I can get a name brand degree online, mostly from Stanford, Georgia Tech, UVA, wherever, or I could go to Joe's local college for the large brick and mortar. Um, so that's question number one. And number two is, uh, do you, we've had a glut of capital spending in higher ed over the past 20 years, and as a policymaker, I personally think it needs to slow way down, and would you agree, because digital is gonna put less emphasis on bricks and mortar? Yeah, so, so, so the capital spending question, let me, let me answer it because it's, it's, it's an easy one. I, I, I think there's an argument to be made for putting the brakes on most capital construction um, um, projects um, that can't explain why they're going to be valuable, relevant 20 years, 20 years from now. So, so building theater style amphitheater lecture lecture halls with fixed seating and, and fancy fancy audiovisual in, in the front makes less and less less and less sense. Whereas building out flexible space that's more like a blended classroom or a flipped classroom uh, is going to be um, is going to be going to be useful. First question is really interesting. So, so my, my, my take on this is, is that um, higher education will become a network business, an internet business, um, which means that like newspapers, there are going to be a few big winners. When I say a few, I mean 100. So there'll, 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 there'll be 100 worldwide brand name universities that are capable of commanding um, uh, tuition that, that people will still, still um, uh, move to, and then a long tail that consists of many, many more universities than we have today. And understand, there are 50,000 universities worldwide. Most of those universities can't answer the five questions that I gave you. 
But there are smaller, more niche-oriented uh, possibilities for universities that don't require capital expenditures. Why? Well, because technology provides you the platform um, that is able to deliver value to individual students. Why? Because personalization technology uh, is is there. So, so my guess is that that the institutions in the middle are going to have to scramble to figure out how they survive in that in that world. Uh, a lot of them won't. Uh, a lot of them will downsize their their efforts. Uh, you know, this seven new universities in Texas that want to become next great research universities will probably have to sacrifice that dream uh, and become institutions that serve their serve their 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 region. Um, the other interesting question is how many professors do we need to do this? And and, and that's and that's a, a really tough uh, a really tough discussion. What, what we're finding at Tech with our um, with our experience with 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 MOOCs uh, is is that to, to mount a successful massive open online course you need a team, uh, and the team consists of a professor, consists of instructional designers and advisors and videographers and 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 technology specialists. But there's probably a team of five people that are involved in creating creating this this course. Um, but that one professor who's now teamed with four other people is now no longer reaching 300 students, he's reaching 30,000 students. So there's the productivity, there's the productivity increase. You average that over all institutions in the country and, and I think the, um, um, the conclusion, to me, to my way of thinking, the inescapable conclusion is that we'll need far fewer of those single professors We'll have super professors. We'll have people that are really good at teaching what they what they teach, and then a variety of educational specialists. Just like when you go to to MD Anderson as a, as a patient, there's a, there's a lead oncologist, and then there are there are counselors and and nutritionists and 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 radiologists, people that are, that surround the the individual patient with a kind of care that 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 scales, and we know that MD Anderson is one of the places that's scaling patient. Um, patient care. You're bound to see the same thing in higher education. It's, it's one of the ways out of the cost disease, in my view. We have one more question at the back of the room near the door, over to, the, to your left. Yes, yes, I have here with me my notice that I received from Case Western Reserve just last week telling me that I had not finished my MOOC course that I had enrolled in and that I was being given the opportunity to catch up with a second time and I could pick up just where I left off. And it was very welcome news to me because I had wanted to complete the entire content, but other things got in the way, which I think when I hear you talk, I hear so many shifts of paradigms that as public policy makers that I don't even know that we can even begin to think about those dots that connect. In terms of free enterprise, we have totally now made available to people in the most liberal definition of free enterprise access to education. Now, whether it comes with a degree or not, content and knowledge is really the wealth that we hope to create in people and in our, our workforce. And when we talk about immigration and the essential economy and the people who have not had access to that, to have the access that you're affording and others that are doing the work at the college level and to think about how that filters down Fifteen years ago, no one had ever heard of the job title of webmaster. I mean, you think 15 years ago, nobody knew what that was. And now it is an essential part of our economy. And I think as public policymakers, it's a responsibility to think ahead of how we restructure our teacher educational curriculum and how, I mean, you look at the Khan Academy, that is attached to no institution. And it is revitalizing the way that students learn algebra and other mathematics skills totally unattached to, unaccredited to by anyone and totally improving the knowledge base of America in science, I mean in mathematics. And so how do we rethink the delivery of our educational content to focus towards the need for learning navigators or learning facilitators as opposed to teachers of content that might be delivered in a better way, more cost effective in a free market approach? Boy, it's a great question. And, and I, I will tell you that the whole system is designed to, to take care of 18 to 24 year olds. So, so, so we, we've built up a system of higher education that, that is aimed at taking, taking kids before they enter mom or dad's business 
and parking them for four years so they can they can they can learn something. And the way that we talk about universities is filled with this kind of uh, imagery, student experience, residential residential students. In some cases, still you know the parental view of, of what what the university is is for. And boy, the world has moved so far beyond that. 18 to 24 year olds are no longer the predominant source of college students. It's what we used to think of as non-traditional students. These are returning servicemen, new arrivals to the US, people, late, later life learners who are coming back for a second or third career that need to be, uh, that need to be re-educated. Um, re um, and, and the policy has not, has not kept up with that. I, I heard, I, I've been on a, been on a, um, uh, a, a trip gathering information for the, for, the, for the new book, and I'm just kind of filing away crazy ideas that I laughed off you know, one night and then woke up in the middle of the night and said, well, maybe, maybe that's not such a crazy, crazy idea. If, if, if we really want 18 to 24 year olds to have a good college experience, why in the world are we relying on universities to do that? We should be subcontracting that out to Disney. <laughs> Who knows more about creating an experience? Um, and and I, I, I heard that idea and thought it was and thought it was it was a joke. But there but there's an element of of rational thought here. Um, maybe we should be not operating dormitories. Maybe we should be figuring out what part of the student experience really should be done by a third party who knows what they're doing and priced and, and, and priced accordingly. Um, one of the reasons that we got to a six thousand dollar seven thousand um, dollar price tag for the for the online master's program was we were able to filter out costs that had nothing to do with what a terminal master's student wants. Someone who's coming to Georgia Tech for a master's degree really doesn't care about the athletic fee. So that goes. You know, they really aren't going to live in a dormitory. So all the costs associated with that, with that go. And every one of those discussions was a very tough discussion both within Georgia Tech and you know, within the university system. But we got to this $6,000, $7,000 degree by saying, so what is really our cost in getting that student a Georgia Tech quality, quality degree? Well, it's something south of $7,000. Productivity increases, what we thought the market would, would bear, what we thought we needed by way of new faculty, and $7,000 is a comfortable, for 10,000 students, is a comfortable, is a comfortable price point. Uh, that needs to be thought out on a large scale by many hundreds of institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, let's offer a warm thank you to Rich DeMillo. Thank you.